And that's what we began to see changing in the 19th century through immigration and urbanization and then secularization. As the century wore on, the attack on Christianity as a viable intellectual commitment began to grow and grow in America. It grew out of Darwinism and the new notions that we could explain the origins of species entirely naturally. We didn't need God. And it grew out of the increasing attacks being launched against the historicity and truthfulness and reliability of the Bible. Biblical criticism began to arise. And Christians began to shift from feeling confident about the future, began to shift from believing that God was at work in this world to glorify his Christ in our time in history, to begin to feel besieged, to begin to feel in retreat, to begin to withdraw. And many, many Protestants in America took refuge in a new eschatology, a pessimistic premillennialism, which said, we are besieged and things are likely to go from bad to worse, but don't worry. Jesus is coming soon to rescue us out of it. There was a hymn that captured this. I've never sung it at Ligonier. As far as I know, Pink Floyd never sang it. But the hymn was, Hold the fort, for I'm coming. Jesus whispers something, something. Like Isaac Watts, I could never get the poetry straight. Unlike Isaac Watts, I could never get the poetry right. But that was the new attitude. Hold the fort. Let's withdraw. We're surrounded by enemies. Left to ourselves, we'll, we'll go under. But Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming again. It doesn't really matter. See, whether you're a post-mill or a pre-mill, you're able to say it doesn't really matter. We may not have to engage with this. We can continue in our anti-intellectual ways and just say it's all about revival, it's all about experience, it's all about just getting people converted. And we can let the world go to hell in a handbasket. That's not vulgar, that's literal. Because Jesus is coming so soon, none of it matters. But you see, it was, it was a retreat. It was a retreat into an anti-intellectualism that we as Christians too many of us were willing to embrace. And it's dangerous. It's dangerous and it's unnecessary. Christianity is fully capable of a glorious and convincing intellectual defense and propagation. We are not people who have embraced a religion born out of a myth, born out of an untruth, or born out of a kind of spirituality that is divorced from history and truth in this world. Our religion says precisely the opposite. Our religion is born out of history. Our religion is born in truth. Our Savior is the one who said, I am the way, the truth and the life. And, and that, is our, that is our conviction. That is our, our passion. Do you know what the motto of Harvard University is? Veritas. Truth. Do you know what it used to be? Veritas Christi. The truth of Christ. And there has been an assault on the truth of Christ. There has been opposition to the truth of Christ. It's been growing. It's come to dominate the intellectual world in which we live. But it hasn't happened because Christianity is incapable of intellectual defense. It's happened in part because Christians, for a time in America, 
in large numbers gave up on trying for an intellectual defense. Now we know that an intellectual defense of the faith, however inherently convincing, is never going to renew a heart. Only the Spirit of God can do that. But an intellectual defense of the faith is important to encourage Christians and to challenge non-Christians to pause, to think, to reflect. The saddest thing about conceding that in some sense we live in a post-Christian world is that it almost allows and validates people saying, well, it's a post-Christian world. That means Christianity is passe. I don't need to think about it. I don't need to reflect on it. It's just old-fashioned. It's as crazy as thinking that pop music stations would prefer to play Isaac Watts over against Pink Floyd. It just is crazy talk. But Christianity is capable of scholarly defense. And it's so important that we recognize that. And that's why in the last 50 years or so, we have seen something of a reemergence, a restatement of a commitment to an intellectual defense of Christianity and an intellectual challenge to the anti-Christian thought forms of our time. R.C. Sproul is an excellent example of that. And Ligonier Ministry has been doing that for 40 years. We think back on Francis Schaeffer as another example of one who sought to engage in the thought forms and the culture of his time with a Christian defense. And it's interesting, more recently, there have been a whole series of books that have addressed these things. David Wells in some very significant books, No Place for Truth and God in the Wasteland, looking not just at the broader culture in which we live, but looking at the church, looking at Christianity in our time and asking, is there a place for truth in Christianity today? How are we doing with that truth thing? And challenging churches and Christians to get back to embracing the truth and standing for the truth. Henry Steele Cominger, one of the great American historians of an earlier generation, said that, quote, during the 19th century and well into the 20th, religion prospered while theology slowly went bankrupt. And I think we can still say that in the 21st century. Religion is prospering, but how's theology doing? One of the dangers, one of the besetting sins of the experience-driven, equality-driven American Christianity of the 19th century was, as many historians have observed, that personalities were strong and institutions were weak. Personalities were strong and institutions were weak. We've seen that recently vividly illustrated in Southern California with the bankruptcy of the Crystal Cathedral. Some of you read about that. Robert Schuller, on the strength of his personality, built a remarkable church, the Crystal Cathedral. But when Robert Schuller retired, the institution was weak because it had been personality driven. And now the Roman Catholics have bought the Crystal Cathedral to make it a real cathedral. All sorts of ironies there. We won't get into that. But you see, it, it's illustrative of this tendency, this tendency to allow strong personalities to dominate 
so that religion prosper, but theology goes bankrupt. Did you ask yourself when you saw Rob Bell on the cover of Time magazine talking about hell? Did you ask yourself, what does he know? Why wasn't R.C. Sproul on the cover of Time magazine to talk about a theological topic? It's because Rob Bell is a strong personality who had a big church, and it doesn't matter whether he knows any theology or not. He's equal to everybody else. He has an opinion, maybe an opinion that uh, Time Magazine likes better than R.C. Sproul's opinion on hell. But this is, this is the character of America, you see. And, and what happens in the America where theology is going bankrupt? You don't really have an absence of theology. You just have lots and lots of bad theology. Bad ways of thinking about God. Bad ways of thinking about the Bible. Bad ways of thinking about salvation. And bad ways of thinking about how our society is held together and how it can go forward. Mark Knoll wrote The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind about the same time that David Wells was writing. Daryl Hart wrote The Lost Soul of American Protestantism on the same theme, commenting that Protestants, by trying to make religion relevant, had ended up trivializing Christianity. And it's interesting, this wasn't unique to Christians. At about the same time, or maybe even a little earlier, Harold Bloom had written that remarkable book, The Closing of the American Mind, expressing his profound concern about the anti-intellectualism he saw in the American university. In the introduction, the first sentence of that book Bloom wrote, there is one thing a professor can be absolutely certain of. Every, almost every student, almost every student entering the university believes, or says he believes, that truth is relative. If this belief is put to the test, the professor can count on the student's reaction. They will be uncomprehending. Students in the American University, here's Harold Bloom teaching at a very distinguished university, the University of Chicago, 1987, says every student, almost every student who comes to the university to study believes that truth is relative and you ask and you press whether that's a good position to hold and they don't even know what you're talking about. It is so ingrained that truth must be relative that that cannot even be challenged. You know, one of the intriguing illustrations Bloom uses of that? The Bible in the university curriculum. He says, we teach the Bible as literature, which means we never are allowed to ask the question, is the Bible true? He says, you know, the Bible is a very dangerous book. If it's true, it could have amazing, did I sound like R.C. when I said that? Amazing consequences. That's true, isn't it? If the Bible's true, it changes everything. So let's just talk about it as literature. Let's just talk about the stories. Let's recognize it informs the history of Western culture, but never Never ask if it's true. You see, John Calvin was aware of the various strains and tensions in the history of Christianity in relation to the intellect. And Calvin said in his institutes, one extreme amongst Christians is to think we don't need to know anything. And the other extreme is to think we know a lot more than we know. 
And in his commentary on 1 Corinthians 8, he quotes an old proverb. He says, an old proverb said, nothing is as arrogant as ignorance. If you know anything, you probably know that because you've talked to some ignorant person who doesn't know what you know, and they claim they do. Nothing is as arrogant as ignorance. Unless it's being puffed up with knowledge. And Calvin says, how do we, how do we balance these things? He said, well, we allow the Bible to balance them for us as we desire to know useful knowledge. Not speculation into things that we can't comprehend that are too high for us. Not refusing to think about what the Bible has revealed to us and encouraged us to know, but to pursue useful knowledge. Knowledge that is useful for our minds and for our wills. Knowledge that will enable us to understand the wonderful depths of the truth that God has given us in his word and encouraged us to think through and think out and study the implications of it. God calls us to the renewing of our minds. God calls us to loving him with all our minds. God calls us to recognize that our Savior is the truth. To remind us that our Savior said to us, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth of Christ's word, the truth that is in Christ, is the truth that sets free. We don't want to go beyond freedom and dignity. We want the freedom and dignity that God has given us first as his creatures, and then as those whom he has redeemed at great cost in the blood of his Son. And the way for us to testify to that Christ is not by being anti-intellectual, but to use the minds God has given us to serve him, to think his thoughts after him, to think carefully and deeply about things, So that we can say that in our day and in the days to come, we don't want just religion to prosper, but we want theology to prosper. The true theology born out of a careful study of God's Word, so that God may be glorified, that the truth of Christ might be exalted, and many may be drawn to a true and profound saving knowledge of Christ. May God grant us to see progress in that direction in our time. Let's pray together. O Lord, our God, we are thankful that you have showered upon us so many remarkable gifts. And we acknowledge that we have not made the use of any one of them that we ought. And we acknowledge that one of the great gifts that you have given us is our minds, our minds to serve you, our minds to think your thoughts after you our minds to demonstrate that we are made in the image of God. And we pray, O Lord, that we might be those who reject both ignorance and vain curiosity and pursue, according to your word, a useful knowledge to glorify Christ, to build up his church, to defend the truth, and to see many set free by the truth. Hear us and bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.